Cool. All right. Well, um, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Harry, for uh, sitting down with us here. And um, let, I'm excited to get into a conversation regarding a few things that are, you're very passionate about yourself, what you do and what I do and how that kind of uh, intersects from two different worlds. You know, you're from coming from a field of medicine. I'm in the financial space with insurance and sales and training. So uh, what I think is cool, though, about what we were going to talk about is habits and uh, daily activity and goals and those kind of things. It really doesn't matter what industry you're in. You can meet someone who's successful in any walk of life and those patterns kind of overlap. Has that been your experience? Yeah. And, and Brian, uh, thanks so much for, for having me on. That's exactly right. Um, habits are habits. Good habits are good habits and bad habits are bad habits. Mm -hmm. And in the world of medicine, we have our own challenges. Like in the world of, of insurance and sales that you are, you have your own challenges as well too. But the, the commonality uh, is the most successful, the most successful salespeople, as you, you may know, and the most successful physicians and nurses um, are the ones who have habits, good habits. Now, there are, there are bad habits as well, but it's laying down good habits and good rituals. And uh, that really has been my experience, not only for myself, mm -hmm. but for the people uh, that I know are who I try to model after they have a set of habits that lead them towards success. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we can learn from almost anyone who has that strong uh, set of skills, whether it's an entrepreneurial coach, a physical coach, like a trainer, uh, or maybe, you know, a senior, someone senior to, to you as your you know, a mentor or a guide as you're coming into your field. So um, how have you constructed your daily habit routine? Sure. I have, I've struggled with this uh, for many years until um, it almost became a must for me. I was entering that dark road of, of burnout and I really had no one to turn to. Um, I have a beautiful and loving wife and I've got two great children, but I didn't wanna you know, burden them with some of the challenges that I was having at work. And I'm very, very fortunate that I have a fantastic team and a fantastic group of colleagues that work with me. Mm -hmm. But also, I didn't want to share my burdens with them because I didn't want to feel that I just, um, I didn't want to feel, I guess, in their eyes that I just wasn't cut out to be a physician. You know, I didn't want ever that. And it's this narrative that I created in my brain, like, oh, here, you're not good enough to be an ER doctor. Why, you, why are you having even these problems? You know, you can kind of buck up, you'll, you'll be okay. Um, so that's when I started really digging deep into myself and try to create these habits for myself. And that's how I started creating uh, blogging about it and podcasting about it and then creating my platform. But the way I typically do it is I defend my morning and my evening. I book in my days. And the way I do that, Brian, is I have um, a, a mnemonic called Arise. That's my morning and uh, sleep, that's my evening ritual, because sometimes my mornings um, are at 2 p.m. because I work the night shift, for example, but my arise ritual is very straightforward. It's A-R-I-S-E. A is affirmation. So the first thing that I talk about or I get my brain uh, started in the morning is an affirmation. I'm a great leader. I'm a great father. Today's going to be a great day. You can serve people today. You are a phenomenal servant leader today. That's an affirmation I start my day every single day. The R is read. That's a, that's a non-starter for me. It has to get done 10 to 15 pages a day, every day without a question. Mm -hmm. I is inhale, five deep breaths. S is I do what's called scribbling, which is basically my journaling. journaling yeah. And then mm -hmm. E is exercise. Exercise is something that I think is so vitally important for the mind and the body, of course, but it just helps with starting my day. And what I was going through prior to starting this was I always kind of said, well, if I finish my shift on time, I'll go work out. And mm -hmm. it just never got done. It right. just never got done. Right. So, but if I include it in my morning ritual, my E for exercise, it gets mm -hmm. done every single day. And that's just a tip of my, my morning. Uh, but you have a unique set as well too, though, Brian, what is your morning like? Well yeah, as you were as you were explaining this, I was just thinking to myself how how um, much overlap it is in there. So um, 
I did not grow up in a very disciplined household. My parents were, I mean, I was the oldest of three, but my parents were just pretty hands off with me. And then when they split at 14, there was just nothing that just, you know, I didn't have any accountability in my life. But what I realized over a period of time, um, especially in the last two years, getting more into you know mentorship and, you know, becoming a coach and being coached by people is I have a high responsibility to someone that I want to, um, you know, commit my commitment to them and fulfill that commitment. So having a trainer in my life and knowing that he's through our, our app, you know, looking over my shoulder, having another men, having my, my personal mentor, uh, who's a, who's also a pro athlete that is an additional help to go, okay, these people are a responsibility to the commitments we made with them. So I have been tweaking and re, kind of retweaking my schedule based upon actually tracking it. So I'm up at five. Um, I read, I read 10 page or let's talk about the 10 pages. It's basically, I'm reading my the chronological Bible, two of the days in the morning. I read one page from a book called the daily stoic and another one, uh, that is a men's devotional book. It's, just, it's a daily devotional book. So that's my morning read, get my stuff. I hit the gym. I want to hit the gym by six, start my workout till seven. And I specifically chose the gym for two reasons that I go to for two reasons. Uh, one, it's the same gym that my mentor goes through across town. Uh, so I have access to go be with him a couple of times a month. But this gym specific also has a locker room, which my former gym didn't. So I can get mm. all my get ready and then head to the office. So by 730, I've already read, ate, uh, had spiritual time because I'm reading the Bible and studying the Bible, gotten ready, and I'm bound to the office before most people are even getting up by 8 a.m. So, um, and I also found the same thing with exercise. It's, if you can't knock it out early, it makes it much more difficult to knock it out in the day. Um, I am on a program though of having two exercises a day. So we've committed to, as a family, um, we have, we, I mapped out this little 22 minute walk. So we go twice for 45 minutes. I wear a weighted vest. My wife and son aren't, (laughs) but, um, that's, we walk the dogs. So now the entire family is spending these 45 minutes together. So it benefits the dogs. It benefits us from a physiological yeah. standpoint. And we have these conversations as a family. Yeah. You mentioned something uh, that I, I really want to touch on for just a sec. Number mm-hmm. number one, I read the Daily Stoic every day. I'm a big fan of Ryan Holiday. I listen yep. to his podcast every single day too. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and for those uh, of our listeners, um, if you don't know about Ryan Holiday and the Daily Stoic, Take a look at it. He he he's he does a very unique way of shifting your mindset to, hey, I never thought about it that way, mm-hmm. but I'm going to now. He's very good at it. But Brian, the other thing that you mentioned, it, which I thought was so key, and I really want, I know for sure for my listeners to listen to, is mm-hmm. that of mentorship. Okay. Yeah. And I'll tell you why, Brian, because in and we talked a little bit before, and in medicine, you are guided to a certain point. You are guided till you finish your residency. And then after that, you're kind of on your own. And that I think is such a huge disservice for us in medicine. And I think a lot of ego gets in the way where I don't need a coach and Mm -hmm. I don't need a mentor. So let's, if you're able to, can you just dive a little bit more on how that has helped you? Because I really want our listeners to, to appreciate that because I can tell you and, and, and my listeners can listen to this every single podcast I've ever done, Brian, there's always this mention of mentorship. There's right. always this mention of coaching. So mm-hmm. uh, it tell us a little bit about yeah. how it, it has changed you. So, yeah, one thing I will, I will preface with coaching and mastermind groups is I have seen people, this is kind of, I mean, in almost any field, you see people take it to an extreme, Yeah, you know? but um, if you're going, you know, joining a mastermind and having the network is very strong and then having someone also, or it could be within the same network who is a personal mentor to you, or you can go and specifically seek someone by a uh, specific category. Like, so here's, here's mine. Now this might sound like a lot, but it's really managed well. So it's, I started two years ago within the apex community. So I'm going to, I'm going to, one of the executive coaches with the apex community, I have um, eight people that I work with and I'm their, their coach. And this starts off in a business situation. So, um, I worked through before I became a coach, worked through that. And I was under, um, being coached by a wonderful, wonderful woman who, in the same industry. Her name is Jessica Stroud. And we still coach or talk to each other, uh, a couple of times a month, but that was my first foray. I also have a trainer. 
Um, so last fall, I felt strong on the business side and I felt I was feeling better with the physical stuff. I actually, uh, in February of 2020, I'm six foot two, I weighed 230 pounds, but I, that's what Dak Prescott weighs, but I don't look like Dak Prescott. <laughs> <laughs> so it hit me that I need to lose weight. That's why I incorporated a trainer. Um, but last fall I was feeling, okay, I lost the weight. I was feeling strong business wise. I said something was missing from the, the situation of like family and faith part. Uh, so that's when I went and uh, added a mentor uh, specifically in that field. Someone I've sp seen speak a couple of times, very, very strong uh, faith, incredible family, uh, family man, very strong father. And we talk about those kind of things, that personal stuff. Now, I also have a mentor when it comes to marketing and branding. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I am, I'm a writer and I've added more magazine writing content now. So now I've added Forbes entrepreneur, good man project, uh, medium. So I'm, I'm writing a lot more. And so I have an editor, my book editor has, I've kept, kept her on as, you know, as my full on editor. So that's another person. Uh, and then I do have a specific business, um, business coach at, that's different. So I've got several people in my life that are mentors for me. You don't have to go to that level if you want that much in there, but I would yeah. definitely find someone within a network or someone that you can come to either in your field specifically, that's what you want to work on or another part of your life that's gone further than you have. So you can learn that as well. Yeah. So that's um, exactly right. A tribe of mentors, yeah. in, right? In the circle of many, in the council of many, yeah. for sure. What so are that's your, fantastic. Yeah. You have mentors too? Yeah, I absolutely do. Um, and, and similarly to you, uh, mm -hmm. I have a mentor, um, you know, for, for, for business. Okay. I have also a mentor for medicine okay. and I also have a mentor for, um, for faith. And okay. that's, that's, that's really what, yeah. um, what's really helped me guide, guide, guide me. And, um, you had said it, I think really, really well is, you know, part of really what you do. And I find this, that's why I just love having, having this opportunity to speak with you, Brian, is your role of service, right? You, if you want to be of service to your family, to mm -hmm. your greater community, to your clients, you have to be at a level that you are able to be there, right? You can't, you can't help others if you are, you're running on empty as well, right? right. You, you, you can't, you, you can't, um, if your cup is full with, with uh, nonsense, you can't fill it with anything more. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You only have a certain capacity. Yeah. Um, 100%. What, what I like about, and if you're going to, you know, for the audience listening, seeking a mentor, make sure it's someone who's not just going to take your money and right. not uh, provide any value. Um, but also you, you want to make sure that those people are going to keep you in check. Meaning mm -hmm. if you're not, you know, applying or doing what you said you were going to do or the commitments you made within your program or within your, uh, your coaching or your mentorship that they check you. Yeah. Um, you also want to make sure that they've gone, they've done something, whatever you're seeking for their mentorship, that they can actually um, apply that in their field. Yeah. Like some people that are coaches for the sake of being coaches, nothing wrong with that. I know two people who are coaches and it's their entire organization. However, they have history of being successful in their field and have made into a full coaching business. They didn't yeah. just one day goes, I'm gonna be a coach for what? Like, Nothing against someone like this, but I would be very skeptical of someone who's 22 years old, unmarried, no kids, and then they're a life coach. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, so um, be studious when it comes to looking for your person. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I, I like your I, I like your commitment there. Um, the arise part um, it, it helps to kind of keep you on check. A lot of the entrepreneurs we're, we're very good at having the the to do list kind of thing. So mm -hmm. it's a good reminder. Okay, did I hit this? 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 Like I'm. Um, 75 hard has become popular in the, the entrepreneurial space. And it, yeah, it has an app and keeps you in a checklist. Did I, yeah. did I drink my gallon? Did I get my inside outside work? And it keeps you on task. Yeah. So I like how you formatted that piece there. Yeah. You, you got something, uh, I think Brian, that, uh, that I've seen as well too. And I really, really liked is, okay. is your beams approach toward development. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So about that? yeah, I just, um, so on pod, um, uh, a couple of episodes ago, prior to this recording of my podcast, um, I literally wrote it. It's for a book. So I'm in, um, 
within the apex group, there are six of us who are just kind of found each other as brothers. So we're also coaches in the group. Two of them are executives within the apex program, but uh, all six of us are coaches. And we gave a, we gave a presentation in February and we took the recordings of those. We wanted to turn it into a book. Well, my recording, my speech, uh, leadership was one piece, but the other piece was, I, I really got uh, very personal in terms of like religion and spirituality and things that have happened to me. So I didn't think that that matched for that thing. So what I really was, I stepped back a second and I, I was like, we hear a lot about personal development, like, go, you know, go work on this, go, you know, go time management, go work on, you know, spirituality habits, that kind of things. But there's very little instruction of what that actually means and how to absorb it, in my opinion. So um, I got to thinking about the idea of how we balance our time, how we construct our lives, and the idea of balance from a pure work-life balance. Uh, we heard that get popular in the 70s and 80s. It was interesting, though, it came out after the Civil War. Yeah. It literally was, was this movement to literally divide your day in two. Or, I'm sorry, this person wanted to divide their day in three equal parts of eight. That was the idea. You sleep for eight hours, you work for eight hours, your family, your home for eight hours. Um, in America, in kind of our busy schedule, we get this pressure on ourselves to have quote unquote balance. But the idea of balance is really unattainable or for most people from the get go. So let's say you sleep seven to nine hours. So you're only awake, you know, 17 to 15 hours a day, right? Mm -hmm. If you're at the office eight hours, that doesn't mean you're just only working eight hours. You have probably an hour getting ready in a commute another hour getting ready to commute, but rarely do you, if you're an entrepreneur, work just eight hours. So yeah. you're automatically shooting yourself in the foot, the idea of quote balance. We feel this guilt in ourselves. So I said, well, like a scale, like a balance beam scale, you can put pieces on there and some pieces of your time, maybe less time, but are more valuable. You know, an ounce of gold is smaller than an ounce of aluminum. Yeah. Right. So, um, I went back a step and said, okay, when you're looking through developmental pieces, and I'm really heavy on acronyms, like I like your acronym stuff. Mm -hmm. So the yes, idea of beam to create a balance, not a balance in equality, but a balance in not a balance of, um, quantity of time, but a balance of quality of time. I looked at B for beliefs, E for emotions, A for actions, M for metrics, and S is syndicate, meaning your group to assist you. So if I go and look at a category, let's say my uh, fitness. So I was 40 pounds overweight in 2020 or 40 pounds heavier than I usually had been in 2020. What are my beliefs in regards to, to weight loss? Uh, I never saw myself as a fat boy. I grew up playing baseball, mostly baseball, I played football, I played hockey. Um, I never saw myself being overweight, especially not with a, with a beer gut looking belly, mm -hmm. right? So in my mind, I have the body of an athlete. So that's the belief that I have. What emotions are tied up into physical fitness? Well, I'll feel better. I'll have more energy. I'll feel more attractive. Okay. These are the you know, emotions that get tied up into, into this. And you're also happier because you're less depressed. Um, you know, from the physical side that uh, being overweight causes some hormonal imbalances yeah. that can make you, um, you know, feel less happy. <clears throat> What actions do I need to take? That's simple. I just go through the apps that my, that my trainer has done, has set for me. Uh, my mentor is also, you know, former NFL player. Uh, he owns two supplement companies. That's someone I can definitely speak to regards that. And so working out with him and then working out, I work out by myself, but you know, there's trainers at the gym. Like this morning, I went through a stretch routine with the staff trainer. We took through all that stuff. So those are the actions I can take, take, take with me. Um, Metrics, simply track it. Um, I added, not because you have to do this, but I added a fitness band called Whoop. Yep. W H O O P. I've seen this on quite a few people, but this literally tracks my strain in the day, how effective my workouts are, and how effective my sleep has been. And I've noticed with the sleep, I actually recover better on less time. Yeah. Yeah. So I can sleep really my optimal thing is high five or six hours of sleep. When I go over that, it's like this tip of scale of too much. Mm -hmm. But I also noticed I, if I work out late in the day, like Mark has, my trainer is on the, we, we challenge everybody to do this push up challenge for the month of May. Well, if I do my push ups after 9 PM, I sleep better. Is that right? 
Yeah, it's kind of odd. Most people are like, well, if you exercise, you get this boost of energy. No, it actually helps me sleep better yeah. by doing them after nine, somewhere between nine and 10. Um, and then syndicate is my group. Who am I involved with that? So I have my, you know, my, my goon brothers that, that keep me accountable. Uh, I can share stuff within the, you know, fit, fit, different fitness groups that I'm in. And I've got mentors like Mark and Steve who I can come to and discuss this with. And I, of course the doctor, I'm on some supplements too. And the doctors that helped me get on the supplements is another person I can kind of come to and say, Hey, I got a question about this, got a question about that. And they also help me keep you on track and encourage me through that. So by applying that format, I've gotten more information. I've opened it up more to just sit, just physically, or just, just simply saying, I'm going to get in better shape. Yeah, for sure. So. And I think you mentioned, I think such as so many gold nuggets there too, in regards to, to metrics and tracking. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's a common theme that I think we've seen on, on our, both of our industries is if you, if you don't track it, then you don't know. And the your, yours, what is a, what a great example, especially with, you wouldn't have known that if you do your push-ups mm -hmm. after 9 p.m. Um, because there's no data to support that. Right. Um, everybody uses a different type of planner. I'm a big fan of the full focus planner because part of the full focus planner that Michael Hyatt uses mm -hmm. is he has a um, has you track it. He's got a habit tracker where you know you decide whatever the habit that you want to um, achieve for that quarter, and he has you track it every single day. Um, and then he has you go through a week review, a weekend review as well, mm -hmm. too. I think time, uh, Brian, is is the thing that I think many, many struggle with. Sure. And what are some things that that uh, you do to kind of keep yourself on track uh, with your time and how do you manage your time? Well, the, um, I, I do have a pretty tight schedule that I put. Um, this is another exercise. Uh, I'd be happy to share this you know, as we go through it here. But um, so... I literally wrote down every hour that I'm awake and what, first off, what I would like to do in that hour and then go back and say, what am I really doing <laughs> in that hour? Yeah. Uh, because it doesn't make a difference if you say, well, I'm gonna get up at five and then you roll over at five 30, then six, you know, you wasted some of that stuff. Um, plans like 75 hard kind of push you to direct you to make you do it on task because you it's like, okay, well, you know what? I'm gonna work out in the afternoon. No, no, no. You got to work out twice in the afternoon right. and they're going to be three hours apart. Yeah. If you work out this morning, you're putting yourself up to midnight and then you're going to start this cycle of, you know, tiredness, negativity. So yeah. um, from that though, I was like, okay, how much am I applying to each piece of my life? How much am I, am I applying to my fitness? How much am I applying to my faith? How much am I applying to my financial work? How much am I applying to my family? The, looking at that and going, okay of my day, this is the track and how I need to, to put it in. There are occasionally things that will do can derail you, but if you can have the discipline to stick to the format that you've set, yeah, your life actually becomes easier. In my opinion, some people think, Oh, discipline is so hard. I, I think the opposite is true. If um, like I've heard the story before, I don't know if you have, but like Steve jobs were the same thing every day. Mark Zuckerberg yeah. is the same way. It was yep. the same thing every day. It's like, well, that's, that's boring. And then no, what you do, you're simplifying your life. Yeah. Um, I, with the, with my breakfast, lunch, dinner, or two lunches, um, I eat the same thing every day. Now my wife knows if we want to do something for dinner, I'll be malleable with that. But the rest of the time I've outlined, I've outlined everything. So it removes having to go now, what do I want for breakfast? Where yeah. am I going to go for lunch? Yeah. It removes all that stuff. Yeah. If you digitize it with a Google calendar, it makes it even simpler. So um, anyway, that's me. What is your, what's your format? I think you and I are very, very similar. I, um, I'm a, I two things I do. I'm a, I'm a very big fan uh, of time blocking and I do it once a week. Now mm -hmm. it's always on a Sunday if I'm not working on that Sunday. Um, so two things are very important for me to set up my, my week. So it's successful. Okay. Number one, I have a, a, a date night with, with my wife. Yep. Always, mm -hmm. always, even with COVID, we would do indoor date nights. And that means the kids, you know, the kids would watch their TV, you know, for 45 minutes, but it was just my time with, with my wife. Mm -hmm. And during that time, we take out both of our calendars and we share a Google calendar together and we say, okay, what are, 
what are our musts? So for example, yeah. um, here are my days that I work. And, and again, my, my schedules are a little bit different because sometimes I work a day shift. Like for example, tomorrow I'm working a day shift, but yeah. a day after that I'm working a 2 p.m. to 11 p.m. shift. So okay. she needs to know that so she can kind sure. of plan out her day as well too. Right, right. And then, but I also know what her needs are. So that's when we plan, plan out our workouts. I'm working out in the morning. She mm. works out later in the morning. Or if I'm off in the morning, then I, you know, I do this thing. So that's the first thing that I think that's important for me is I have to get the date night done because that's when we talk with, um, yeah. with my wife, uh, what needs to get done for the week, but it's also our time to dream together. Mm. It's our time to dream together to say, okay, this is what our week is going to be, but what's next month going to be like, what's next year going to work, look like, what are we striving for? What are we dreaming toward? Right. You know, are we dreaming toward? And it's kind of funny because um, we, it's not until we started doing this that we realized we had uh, different dreams for the family. So mm. for example, you know, my wife, Francesca, she would love uh, a home on water, on the, on the waterfront. For me, I would love a home in the mountains, but had we not talked about it, we'd be both, <laughs> you know, striving for two different, two different goals. Right, we, right. We've ended up figuring that out. But the second thing, Brian, that I do is I time block. I'm a very big fan of it because that I've actually gained more time doing that. Yeah. Similar to you, um, from Sunday to Saturday, during my waking hours, I plot out exactly what I do hour by hour. And when you say that to people, they look at you like you have some kind of uh, mental health problem where you're just being so OCD about it. But mm -hmm. then when you, you show them what you've done, you've shown them that you actually gain more time by doing that. Absolutely. I always try to plan at least two, if not three days a week of what deep work, three hours of uninterrupted time mm -hmm. where my phone is on focus mode where I don't hear anybody. My door is shut right behind me and I am focused on doing the things that I'm doing to achieve my goals. Yep. Um, so those are, I think the two biggies, you know, we, weekly date nights. And then I do my, my week of time blocking hour by hour. And you'd be surprised how much you get done in that more than that one week in about half the time. Yeah. I'm, uh, I, I think people are surprised. Uh, that's something that we, we talk a lot about with the apex network is people getting onto a calendar. I think they're, they come surprised. I think, oh, you, you know, you're, you've, um, you structured yourself in such a way that's so constricting. It's actually not. I was talking to um, one of my coaching clients the other day. It's like, you know, I see, you know, people talk about these posts and they, and people have these posts and I see what they're doing. They're you know doing this at this time and all these different things structured. He goes, he goes, are they really operating that way? And I think he said, can someone really operate that way? And I said, actually, there are people, I'm one of them who are operating in that capacity. Um, it takes discipline. It takes them to be able to, okay, this is the alarm. I got it. And that, that's where I struggle with. And is if I don't go to bed at a certain time, then it is going to mess with me. But, yeah. you know, um, have some, if you can build in some flexibility, cool. Um, it's just a matter of being committed to committed to the process and getting those things done each day. But yeah. it is shocking to go, okay, this hour, I've got this, this hour, I've got that. So like when I got here today, our call is scheduled for 10 a.m., um, you know, I got here at nine because I booked that extra stretch session at the gym. I was like, okay, I got one hour to get some to do's done, prep myself for the call, got those things done. We're having our call 11 o'clock. Um, I had a cancellation. So what that does is opens up hour for something else. Now I got a writing hour. Yeah. 12 to one thirty is my call with Steve, my mentor for the summer. This is a commitment that we made one 30 to three. I've blocked off for Wednesdays and that my wife and son will have lunch. And then my son will stay with me the rest of the day, three to five. I'm doing my stuff. He's going to have his thing going on at a desk and then the other side of the office. And then we're going to go swim every day at the Love gym. It. So I'm not, I'm not, it, it sounds maniacal to go, Oh, that's so rigid, but yeah. what did I miss? I, I get, I get business done. I get yeah. my faith and family conversation with, with my mentor. I get more business. I get to spend time with my son and time with my wife at lunch. And then that gives her, that opens up the communication, opens up space for her. Now yep. she has from, you know, I wouldn't, I would say the one, the lunch is still a downtime for her. So for her, she's got one thirty to three lunch, and then she gets the rest of the afternoon to do whatever she wants to do for a little time. Cause we're probably not gonna yep. be home till seven. Love it. And it's just being intentional. I mean, it's the, one thing that I really found useful, there's an app called Toggle. T O G G L. Mm -hmm. And it just tracks, it's similar to um, 
how Apple does where it tells you how much time you're on the screen, but yeah. it takes it the next level. It actually tells you um, exactly how much time you're spending on this app, on this app, on this mm. app. And the first time you do it, it's pretty, it's pretty eye-opening how much time we, um, we're not uh, focused on our goals. I don't want to use the word waste your time, but maybe, the, maybe that is the proper word, waste your time. Uh, but how quickly you're distracted and how quickly you go down a rabbit hole. That's why I think for me, deep work is important because I know if I shut off all my notifications and mm -hmm. I just focus on just doing that deep work, it really gets a lot of things done. But, and I think it's also important, Brian, to, to know that it's okay if you don't get it right the first week, because you're not going to, you're not going to get it right that second week, the third week, the fourth week. Or but if you learn from it, like, hey, you know what? I've scheduled myself too close for this. Mm -hmm. I need to do it a little bit better next week. You're going to finally come to an ideal week that you've time blocked for yourself. Mm -hmm. And then you just kind of just model it week after week, obviously with different goals for the week. But once you kind of figure it out, I'm too close together between this meeting and this meeting, so I'm not going to do that next week. And um, I think just give you that, give yourself that grace to say, I'm not going to get it right the first time, but still do it. And yeah. I'm not going to do it right that second week, but still do it. And I think that's, I think so important. I think for people to hear mm -hmm. is, is it's, you're not going to get it right. And that's okay. And that's okay. And you're, you're constantly tweaking too. Like hundred percent. Yeah. Like I was trying to go to bed at, at, you know, somewhere between nine, you know, nine something and to wake up at five. Well, I don't, my body doesn't need that. Because yeah. it was it was interesting to still wake up at five and go, man, I'm just not rested. Yeah. Well, you're over, you went to sleep too much. So yeah. at six hours, and my my whoop band actually shows my REM sleep and my deep sleep. Yeah. And over half the time in a six hour period, I could be in REM or deep sleep. They're true resting. So it's like, huh, had I not been tracking it, I wouldn't have known those things. So exactly right. Exactly. So um I personally feel that this this idea of okay i'll be st strategic and str uh, and intentional and knowing what's ahead prevents burnout so i know you talk a lot about burnout in your in your work there so yeah. uh, what do you see that's uh, kind of the cause and what would be a tip to avoid yeah i, I think there's a, a it's, it's multifactorial what causes burnout mm -hmm. and i think for me what i've seen at, at least in, in the healthcare industry is i i feel that um, People don't um, have that skill set uh, yet to create those habits that leads them to next level. We talked a little bit off offline yeah. um, that when you want to enter the field of medicine, especially as a physician or even as a nurse, you are focused on doing that since high school for many of us. And that's how I was in high school. I knew I was going to become a physician. High school, I was focused on get good grades, get into college, get into the best college you can check. Mm -hmm. I got into college. Then you're focused on, okay, do, do really well in college. You get into the best medical school that you can get check. And then when you're in medical school, then it becomes very, you then that stress ramps up at another level because you are competing to get to the best residency, the quote unquote, best residency mm -hmm. spot. So you are head down and, uh, study you're, you're spending 18 hours a day, you know, you know, overlooking a book. And then you get into that residency spot and then all of a sudden you finish residency and then there's this, there's this big exhale that you've done it and you did, uh -huh. you did. But what I think many people in healthcare don't quite realize is that's just base camp for you. Uh -huh. You've got to complete other mountain to climb. And um, if you don't have that skill set of habits, developing the habits that we talked about today, yeah. you don't seek out mentors that's going to cause your burnout. But I will tell you, Brian, we, we talked a little bit about offline too, is um, finances. Mm -hmm. Finances really, it really burns out a lot of physicians because what happens is you finish uh, medical school and residency, and then you're saddled with, for many of us, six, six figure debt. Sure. But there's also this big exhale because then you become, you go from a you know, mid five figure salary to a six figure salary, essentially mm -hmm. overnight. And you have no idea a how to manage this well. Yeah. And then we kind of talked about this earlier too, because that's really one of the reasons I wanted to speak with you today is you're told that you need to invest money. Sure. So that's being proactive, but then you're also told that you have to defend your, your money, defend your wealth for right. 
for longevity. And then somebody tells you along the line, like, hey, you should probably get insurance. But you have no idea what that means. You have zero idea what that means other than like, well, I know what insurance is. I know what car insurance is. I know what homeowner's insurance is. Right. I know what renter's insurance is because that's how most of us are. But you have no idea about insurance. So then you start going down that road of finances and insurance. And then you just are just so confused. And that's really um, another big component of burnout is we're saddled with six-figure debt. We really have no action plan on how to tackle this. But then you're also told that, well, you just keep working more because you're going to make more. But right. That then leads to burnout uh, because you just don't have a solid team behind you. Yeah. And that's really, I think if you'd be able to talk to us a little bit about yeah. really what types of insurances that, that we would need. Yeah, so I, I, I see uh, or just kind of two things from the conversation, um, but real quick, briefly before the insurance, I think I see this in on, the entrepreneur world too, especially in salespeople when they have a great year and now they had an elevation of mm. finances. I think one of the most tempting things is it's interesting that people can make their life work on four or $5,000 a month. And then when they double, triple, quadruple that, they still are just making it work. Yeah. You think, you think, well, I don't understand you, you, you were paying, you, you said like a mid five figure salary, let's say $5,000 a month. Mm-hmm. Now you're making $20,000 a month and you still have no extra money. What happened? Yeah. Oh, you, you didn't, you got into a house. You didn't, didn't need to buy you. I know, I know some fields and I, and I, I see this in the entrepreneur world. I know in some fields there's, I wouldn't say a requirement, but almost an expectation of a certain sure. look. So if you see a doctor, you estimate that he he should be having a, a mid to high level car. I get that. Yeah. You know, it's not like I know we I know we've heard the story of Jeff Bezos being a billionaire and still driving a Honda. But you know, like you almost say you see someone pull up and you know, if, I, I grew up very frugal and we my wife and I still operate that way. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so there's there's a little bit of responsibility to have certain things that are nice, but you don't have to blow all the money now that you're getting it. So um, but on the protection side, so I'm not a financial advisor. Uh, I do have some investment stuff that I do myself, and that's always good to find somebody, uh, whatever your interest is. Um, I was told long ago, and I fully agree with, agree with this, whatever you invest in should not be uh, more work for you. Um, yeah. In the Apex program, Ryan Stuman, who started the program, he has what they call the 21 rules of money. Uh, you can find that in his podcast, the Hardcore Closer podcast. You can go back and find that. But one of the things he says is don't work for the same dollar twice. So if you've earned that dollar as a doctor or an entrepreneur, don't get into an investment and have to work again to make the dollar back. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so wise words. For yeah. Sure. That's a very good point though. Like, Oh, that's interesting. Yes. You don't create another job for yourself. But uh, as far as protection, I think people, 40% of the U S has life insurance, which you can think of one of two ways you can say, well, what's up with the other 60%. But also that means that two out of five people see the value in it. Um, I think people can consider themselves underinsured in a lot of ways. I get people who come to me and says, I need, I need a life insurance plan. I said, okay, you have a certain amount of money in mind. So yeah, I'll get about a hundred thousand. Um, my, so someone, someone in my space came to me and I asked them about life insurance. They had just had their second baby and they say, well, I'm covered through my work at about $75,000. I said, okay, so you've got a home that you just bought, probably a quarter million dollars. You have two cars under finance, two children are not even in school yet. What's $75,000 gonna do for your wife? Yeah. Not much. So I look at four categories, because this is just from the protection standpoint, not financial advice. This is the protection standpoint. Um, Survivor protection. We use a term life insurance plan and we look at five to 10 years worth of income. If you passed away today, how much money are you earning every year? And ideally, you want to have that last your surviving spouse five to 10 years. Uh, insurance companies won't bat an eye if you take your annual salary and multiply it times 10 for most people. Okay. Now, it does, there is a certain value of life per se. Like um, if a guy is 21 years old working part time at McDonald's while he's in school, you're making like, you know, 10 bucks an hour at 20 hours a week, you probably can't get a million dollars yeah. because it's like, well, that's a bit too much for this, per- this person's earning. But yeah. uh, to say a physician making a quarter million dollars a year, they should probably should have somewhere between uh, two to $5 million in life insurance just for the financial side. Yeah. Um, second part is that creates an estate of its own. 
people accumulate wealth, especially if they have investments, that kind of thing, you're going to accumulate an estate, but life insurance on its own does that. That, that dollar amount itself is an estate. Um, the next part would be protecting major debt. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we commonly see mortgage protection is one of them. That's a fancy way to say a term life plan that's paid directly to the mortgage. But yeah. what's your, you know, if someone has a home, you know, home prices are creeping up, but if it's quarter million, 500,000 million dollar home, they should have a term life plan. That's the same number of years as what's left on the mortgage to cover the home itself. Oh, interesting. Because you shouldn't, ideally, you shouldn't take the home payment from your income payment as well. Got it. Okay. So it's like, okay, I got $2 million. Cool. But half of it's going to go to pay off the home. Then it only leaves another million for however many years. And not a single person ever in history has ever said, oh, that's way more money than I needed. Yeah. I'm still getting the life insurance benefit. <laughs> um, and then those are all term life plans. So term life plans, you can usually buy between 10, 20, 25, 30 years, right? 30 years is probably is the longest one that they'll do. And they usually insure people up to 80, 85 ish, right? Okay. Um, and then, then the next part is saving money. So you put your money into whatever bank account right now, Chase, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, you're not getting anything by having the money in there. Technically it's losing money because of inflation, right? Right. So a great way to save money is to dedicate a monthly amount that'll go into a whole life insurance plan. And you're not necessarily looking for a death benefit here because the death benefit is going to come from your term life plans. Someone says, I can save $500 a month, $1,000 a month, whatever it is, get a whole life insurance plan that puts that money in. The reason I say whole life insurance, it's a permanent plan. It's going to insure you up to age 100. Whole life is a simple, you get a guaranteed minimum interest rate. Most plans are between three and 4%. Uh, the one I use the most, the company called Guardian, they pay at 4%. And the payout is tied to the S&P 500. Now, okay. I know this year, inflation, the reported inflation, I say reported inflation, um, is about 7%, right? So 4%, you're still technically losing money, but over a previous 20 years, 4% was, was fine. You know, the last three years leading up to this year, uh, we were seeing inflations in the one to two percentile. So you're keeping better than inflation, but because it's tied to the S performance of the S and P 500, the last 20 years of the S and P 500 has been about 9%. So they will pay either the guaranteed at four or up to, and this one took them one caps out at 11% because um, they'll pay you up to 11, anything above 11, they're going to keep because they lost money anytime it was less than 4%. I see what you're it's very fair, but the average is they're paying about 9% over the last 20 years. So that's a way to save money. And the cool thing is that whole life plan, you can pull that money out. Maybe you want to put, put it into an, a new investment. Maybe you want to use it for college to start your kid in college. Maybe you want to you know, bequeath it to a, your son for, Hey, congratulations on getting married or something yeah. like that, you know, here's down payment on your first home, something like that. You can set that money aside and it's growing on its own. So it's, in, it's, income it's, protection, estate conservation, and then saving money. And I you know, like to use a whole life plan for that. I, and I know you're not a personal advisor. I, sure. I guess my one question I have on that last thing is what would be, and, and I think you may have mentioned it, you have a guaranteed mm -hmm. rate, whole life versus just putting it yourself in an S and P as an individual investor. Yeah. So the, uh, you could just have it in an S and P the downside is by directly putting it into a hedge fund, that kind of thing is that, that you could have a loss. Yeah. Whereas the insurance plan is going to pay you at least 4%, regardless of the performance of the S and P. So if you were to take the, I see this in illustrations. If you look at the first 20 years of this century, we had on the S and P 500, uh, of the first three out of the first four years, or maybe the first three years it, it, in sequence, all lost money. Mm -hmm. So if I put, say, $10,000 in S&P 500, I'm negative, negative, negative. Then I start gaining back. Whereas if you had it into an insurance plan, it had been plus four, plus four, plus four. Yeah, I see what you're saying. And it, it, it yeah, levels off. So um, if you get, you get your base is four. Now they cap you in this particular example with this company, they're going to cap you at 11. They're just making their money back on the positive 11 because they paid you up to four. 
Yeah. I've I seen understand. years. Yeah. Years where they lose over 20 or 30%. Yeah. In the S and P. That's the only, yeah. So you, you've, you've mitigated your risk. Yeah. Now it's not designed to be an investment, but the idea there is the money is growing anyway. You're saving the money as it's a growth tool. Yeah. You take it to a higher compound interest. Yeah. Totally understand. Well, yeah. thank you. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I teach, uh, we have a licensing course that, that we, that we teach, um, one of my pieces of my organization. Um, and that's one of the illustrations we go through is how a whole life plan works in that capacity. Yeah. So very simple. It keeps it. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a financial advisor to get somebody into, you know, a stock portfolio or if they're, you know, crypto, real estate, whatever. So plenty of people out there that can help you with that. Um, this is just from a protection standpoint and designed to keep it easy. So yeah. very cool. Yeah. Well, I dig it. Uh, well, I appreciate the conversation. A lot of cool stuff. I like your acronyms. Mm -hmm. um, I think you've, you've simplified your approach. I like your dedication to uh, to your wife, your family that you talked about there. And it's not just about pushing the envelope as, much, as far as you can, you know, money wise, and the family gets a backseat. You've dedicated those non negotiables, which is cool. That's the um, yeah, it's very important thing. And I think most people if they intentionally tack their day, they'd be surprised at how much work they can get, get done in those compartments that they allow themselves to yeah. do. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. I like it. All right. Well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Thanks for the time. Yeah.